Hey, it's Norm from Tested. I'm here at Oculus Connect 2, the developers conference for Facebook's and Oculus VR, virtual reality, and I'm so excited. Tim Sweeney is here. Tim, how are you doing? Oh, it's been a great show so far. Yeah, uh, were you here last year? Um, no, no, this so is my first, first one. one. And you get to meet developers, you get to talk about developing VR for Unreal Engine. That's, that's your baby. You've been making, you've been, that, that's your thing. Yeah, that's right. I wrote the first lines of code, about a quarter million lines, and uh, my bugs are still in that code base. Wow. Mm -hmm. And now we're four generations down the line, Unreal Engine 4, incredibly powerful. I, I love going on YouTube and just watching the videos that developers have made, and, like, and their emphasis on, look how realistic it looks, and look at this crazy lighting. Um, Going back to like PC gaming, when we saw Unreal Engine 1 and 2 and 3, we really uh, had the strong uh, focus on just photorealism and you know, making what looked on, on computer monitors as photorealistic as possible. With VR and the, and the hardware requirements being so high, uh, what are the priorities in developing an engine? Well, you know, VR is the most demanding application ever invented. Uh, you know, developers and gamers expect 90 frames per second steady. Um, they expect a very realistic, detailed environment, and so delivering that requires an engine with a lot of performance. You know, so Unreal Engine 4 now is pure C++. All of the engine and all of the gameplay code are in a really highly efficient language. Uh, there's no scripting language barrier. There are no other barriers to get in the way. And you know, with the engine's heritage, you know, in the past powering really high-end PC and console games, um, it is an engine that's completely ready for VR and that's able to meet the performance challenge. And scalable, because you have to have developers working on software that will run not only on a Rift, on a high-end PC, but also the Gear VR. Yeah, that's right. Unreal Engine 4 is being used for a bunch of Gear VR games. Uh, you know, CCP's uh, Gunship is mm -hmm. the premier example, um, but there's a lot more in the works. And, you know, we talk about scaling, but that hardware is actually pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. the, the mobile hardware that's powering mobile VR is you know, state-of-the-art uh, console hardware from the last generation, and so uh, that range of scalability is actually just up and up and up. When you look at like uh, graphics architectures on the PC side, you have NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, and then you have you know, PowerVR and ARM-based systems. On the mobile side, uh, do you have to make any compromises in optimizing for one or the other, or is that just standardized now? Well, you know, we put a lot of effort into optimizing for every platform, um, and there are different techniques in different locations. A render is highly multi-threaded now, and so uh, all of these smartphones now have multiple cores. Uh, we can scale to support that. We can support their GPUs, including the tiling architectures. Mm -hmm. And those GPUs have evolved a pretty high level of uh, performance capabilities and uh, high-end features. So the scalability problem is not nearly as difficult as it was a couple of generations ago when entire sets of features you know, just simply were not available on the low-end platform. Right. Is it less so the feature set parity and just horsepower in terms of you know the, the density of the transistors on, on mobile side? Like when you look at the roadmap, um, do you see more performance parity? Well, you know they are both uh, upward trending exponential curves, and so I think we can always expect that there will be a gap between the highest end PC GPU and you know the most popular consumer uh, you know smartphone GPUs. Uh, but they keep going up and up, and uh, you know. Nowadays, the performance you're getting on uh, these these mobile high-end mobile devices from Apple and from Samsung are mm -hmm. really quite awesome. Um, nothing to complain about at all. So uh, scalability is really a matter of tuning um, to be able to turn features on and off um, and to be able to scale the amount of detail on a scene, uh, which the engine now handles more and more automatically. So for a developer, it's a completely realistic proposition to build a game that scales from Samsung Gear VR all the way up to high-end PC and Oculus Rift and has really awesome high-end features on PC um, that you know, make it unique on that platform. Um, you know, we, we've heard stories of kind of the tricks that developers and even graphics engine makers use uh, when to optimize so you get the maximum frame rate, um, and you're drawing only what's necessary. And when I'm looking at you know a 24 to 30 inch monitor, I'm looking at everything. If I'm looking at VR, my focus is in a specific place, and you can do a lot of level details like tweaks and and tricks. Um, are there things in Unreal Engine 4 that kind of accommodate that, or or things that are more that take into account the optics of VR? You know, VR is really demanding, even though uh, you are generally focused on one area of the screen. Uh, if you spend some time looking at another one um, and you spot flaws there, you're, you're not going to be very forgiving of that. So uh, there's a wide set of techniques we use to optimize for visibility, um, for uh, removing invisible objects, for spreading out the work between wall-through-wall threads, but it's all fairly generally applicable. And that's the great thing about um, 
VR support in Unreal Engine 4. You know, 90% of the work that's required to build a great VR game, you know, we've been building um, on behalf of the broad spectrum of users, including non-VR PC and non-VR mobile and console. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a huge amount of synergy between all of these different uses of the engine. Right, you know, if you're going to spend the resources and hire a couple hundred people to work on a AAA game, you, know, you want to give them tools they can import, or at least have part of the experience be working in virtual reality. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the scaling of teams is really quite amazing in the industry right now. There are single developers who are working for several months and releasing a game all by themselves, scaling up to teams of hundreds of developers producing a AAA game over the course of uh, many uh, years. And it's really quite astonishing that one engine can accommodate the entire dy dynamic range there. And obviously you have an interest in virtual reality and seeing that, like the metaverse, for example. Like, what are your hopes and fears for where the technology is going in the next five, ten years, and where do you think we'll be? Well, I think virtual reality is literally going to change the world. It's going to replace all other computing platforms. And, you know, the hardware we have right now is just the, the really, it's the start of the revolution aimed at, you know, fairly serious uh, enthusiasts um, and gamers. But over time it will shrink and become more powerful and more convenient to the point where it's really just like the, you know, glasses sitting on our face. Once VR is reduced to that, you're going to have a market that will reach billions of users, literally billions. And once you have a display device like that, it's going to encompass all the benefits of mobile hardware, you know, being convenient and portable so you can go around and take it with you. But also all the benefits of high-end gaming, having a high field of view and a very immersive high-res experience. Uh, it's going to take all of these uh, gamers who've come into the ecosystem in recent years with the mobile revolution and open up an entirely new spectrum of game experiences that you're just never going to get on a smartphone when it's occupying 15 degrees of your field of view. Uh, so I'm extremely optimistic about it. Um, and I don't, I don't see any really existential challenges to it. The question is only, uh, does the hardware grow at a pace where it's doubling in audience every year, or is it growing at a pace where it's going to increase by 10x in audience every year? Um, that determines whether we get to our final destination in um, seven years, or if it's more like 15. But there is no doubt that the market's heading that way, and that this technology will be uh, you know, the final platform, as the Oculus folks have said. The final platform. Well, you guys are one step along the way, definitely uh, games and really high quality games, which you guys are also known for in addition to the engines. And you guys at Oculus Connect uh, showed off Bullet Train. Can you talk a little about Bullet Train and, and the thought process of why making a, a high quality AAA style first person shooter in VR? Yeah, it's one of a long series of uh, demos we've used to understand the power and possibilities for new hardware as it becomes available. Um, we use these as learning experiences and then apply them to much larger uh, you know, game projects with a longer production cycle. Um, this effort was aimed at creating a real game experience where you're picking up guns and shooting them you know, as opposed to purely a graphical demo experience. The real opportunity for this demo was to take advantage of the Oculus Touch motion controller uh, to give you just direct mapped control of things because it's almost like using a, uh, you know, an iPad for the first time. When the position of your hands in the real world is directly mapped to the position of your hands in the virtual world, it just has this magical feeling. You know, your brain since childhood has been trained to operate that way, so there's no control scheme to learn. You just know how to do that inherently. So it's to combine that with a locomotion provided by this teleportation system. And that's um, moving around an open world. You're not just locked into a small space. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the big challenges with VR right now is that if you, uh, just have the player move from one place to another, then uh, what you're seeing in the world uh, is disagreeing with what your inner ear is telling you, and um, that tends to lead to motion sickness for a lot of people. So with teleportation, we have a cheap, really easy to implement solution um, to locomotion that also is tied really naturally into uh, gameplay because mm. we pick spots which are really natural to go to and to shoot, um, and you have a lot more uh, potential for the the experience just working out right, um, regardless of the choices the player makes with that kind of system. Yeah, you're assisting them. You're in, it helps with the game design because as a designer, you want to you're designing experiences, right? You're programming situations, and and even though the player has some agency in terms of deciding when they want to teleport, you know, you're orienting them in a certain direction, so they're facing a scene, um, you're making it instantaneous, so yeah. there's no there's no dizzying. Um, it solves some of those problems that other people are trying other with, you know, for example, redirect mm -hmm. walking or some other scale changing. Have you guys thought of any of those things or tried, experimented? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of different paradigms that I think that will work and uh, solve the locomotion problems without motion sickness. Um, teleportation is one. I think just having a slower rate of movement um, uh, than a game like Unreal Tournament uh, is another solution that I've seen work well. Um, putting the player in the 
in a viewpoint that's a third person view compared to their character is also, mm -hmm. uh, it breaks a sense of immersion, but it also uh, convinces your brain that it's not you there, you're just watching this thing, and so you're much more forgiving of those uh, motion effects. So there's a wide variety of solutions. The other idea is, you know, Use a, a map of the world if you're building a game like Minecraft or some tabletop simulation, or it's like SimCity. Use the motion controllers like you would use uh, your fingers on an iPad. You know, use one to grab the world and move it towards you. Move the world around you so that you're always sitting still, uh, you know, or pinch to, with both motion controllers to drag and scale or rotate exactly. the thing. That way, you're sitting still and this entire virtual workspace is being navigated around you. I think there's a wealth of paradigms to be explored there and we're only really at the beginning. I, I have no doubt that we're going to solve all of these uh, problems in ways that are going to be both uh, uh, really convincing to the brain and also broadly acceptable to the gamers. So is Bullet Train just an experiment in your eyes or is that something that can, can actually be a game? Well, uh, for us it's another experiment, but these experiments are all leading in a direction um, that will result in the production of awesome VR games at Epic in the future. You know, we haven't announced any such product yet, no. but we're certainly thinking in those lines and doing development work in those lines. Um, if you look at our history with Unreal Engine 3, for example, for the first couple of years of the engine, uh, we built tech demos to show off its capabilities and to, uh, to learn, you know, so that we can learn uh, from what's possible and what works well with the hardware. And after that, we went into launching Gears of War. And uh, right now at Epic, we are coming out of the tech demo building stage um, and into the game building stage. and. Uh, from here on, we're going to see some uh, really interesting things happen over the next over the next 18 months. I'm so excited to hear and, and look forward to what that may be. Thank you so much, Tim, for chatting with me. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to meet you and chat with you. Cool. We'll have more from Oculus Connect 2 on test.com. Until then. <laughs>